And I honestly couldn't think of a better way to close out this year's summit than hearing from former U.S. Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice and Kevin Rudd, Australia's ambassador to the United States. So I'm just going to take a couple minutes to share a bit about them, clearly just scratching the surface of all that both have contributed to the world. The relationship between the two of them is as strong as is the relationship between the U.S. and Australia. The bond between our two countries is underpinned by shared democratic values and bilateral defense ties that help maintain peace, stability, and in economic prosperity in the Indo-Pacific region. The U.S.-Australia free trade agreement that went into effect almost 20 years ago has strengthened that bond. Just last year, total U.S. goods and services trade with Australia totaled $77 billion, and our foreign direct investment in Australia was $177 billion that year. Economically, there are strong, very strong ties between the U.S. and Australia. The first treaty signed between our countries established the Fulbright Program in 1949. Since then, thousands of scholars have received Fulbright scholarships, so it seems very fitting to have these two coming together at Stanford, one of the world's top universities. Condoleezza Rice has been a part of CEPR's community for many years, long before I arrived, and I'm always so incredibly appreciative when she accepts my invitations to speak at our summit. She's the Tad and Diane Talby Director of the Hoover Institution and a senior fellow on public policy, the Denning Professor in Global Business and the Economy at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. In addition, she is a founding partner of Rice, Hadley, Gates, and Manuel, an international strategic consulting firm. From January 2005 to January 2009, she served as the 66th U.S. Secretary of State, making her the second woman and first black woman to hold the post. She also served as President George W. Bush's National Security Advisor from January 2001 to January 2005. And in the George H. W. Bush administration, she served on the National Security Council staff and was Director and Senior Director of Soviet and East European Affairs. She has been a member of Stanford's faculty since 1981 and served as the university's provost from 1993 to 1999. And she's won the university's two highest teaching honors. She will be moderating a conversation tonight with Kevin Rudd, who is currently Australia's ambassador to the United States. Ambassador Rudd served as Australia's 26th Prime Minister from 2007 to 2010, then as Minister for Foreign Affairs before a second term as Prime Minister beginning in 2013. He was member for Griff Griffith in the Australian Parliament from 1998 to 2013. Ambassador Rudd has become recognized as a leading analyst of China in 2014, he joined the Harvard Kennedy School's Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs as a resident scholar on U.S.-China relations. In 2015, he became inaugural president of the Asia Society Policy Institute in New York. And in 2020, he was appointed president and CEO of the Asia Society. And in 2022, he founded the Asia Society Policy Institute Center for China Analysis. Ambassador Rudd has received many awards, appointments, and honorary positions since beginning his diplomatic career in 1981. Going through the full list of accomplishments for these two individuals would literally take me the rest of the evening to go through, so I'm not going to do that. So with that, it's a tremendous honor for, and privilege for me to welcome Kevin Rudd and Condoleezza Rice to the CEPR Economic Summit. Well, good evening. Um, I'm sure you've had a great uh, time here at the CEPR Economic uh, Summit. This is really one of the premier events uh, for, for Stanford uh, and I think for the economics profession and I'd just like to take a moment to congratulate Mark uh, on his leadership and uh, the entire CEPR community. So if you would join me in doing that. Well, hello, Kevin. Condi, good to be with you. It's and, good to uh, be with you too. So is this how we celebrate the dismal science in, uh, <laughs> in Stanford? Well, so. the remarkable thing is that I think I have had a chance to talk with you as Prime Minister, as Foreign Minister, and now as Ambassador to the United States. Is there I, I, any I other could, job you want in, in government? I have a systematic pattern of career demotion. <laughs> so, uh, 
So uh, next time I'm going to go to back to Beijing to be first secretary in our embassy. Yeah, oh, great. That's kind of where I started. Well, so. I'm going. I'm going to start there because uh, you have an extraordinary background, uh, knowledge of uh, the PRC. Uh, you are a fluent Mandarin speaker, and uh, so I'm going to start with the the following question. Um, if 15 years ago we had been sitting here, would you have believed that we would be where we are in US-China relations, in the course that China has taken? Uh, let me just say, I would not have believed it. I expected something quite different. And uh, if, in fact, you also expected something quite different, what might that have been? And uh, how do we explain where we are? Yeah, it's a great question because it goes to the heart of China analysis and whether we can get it right or whether we're condemned permanently to get it wrong. So we go back to 2009, uh, at least according to Australian mathematics. The bottom line is probably not, that is. I didn't get it completely right. I was prime minister at the time. Now, one defence, though, is this. We did produce a defence white paper that year. It's a public document, uh, which for the first time among all your Asian allies said, China's undisclosed um, military budget and its increased assertiveness in its exercise patterns in the South China Sea, the East China Sea, and across the Taiwan Straits was a cause for strategic concern and represented the basis for which we then recommended uh, an increase in the capabilities of the Australian Navy. Submarine fleet being doubled, the surface fleet being increased by a third. So that's, uh, Your Honour, that's my defence. Uh, what did I get wrong? Though, as a, a guy who's been studying China since uh, the Mesolithic period, uh, is, um, uh, is that when Xi Jinping came to power in 2012, uh, three years after that, and I knew him somewhat by that stage when he was vice president after he became president. We overlapped a little while. Uh, is that uh, I did not anticipate that he would so fundamentally move the country in a different direction in its politics, economy and foreign policy. I was sensing in 2009 some shift. I did not anticipate that shift if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. And how would you describe the shift? Uh, and, and perhaps more importantly, what is the explanation for the shift? If you, if you were the proverbial man from Mars and you looked at where China was in 2009, 2010, you would say things are going pretty well. Uh, people believe that you're a great bet for foreign uh, direct investment. Uh, you have produced golden children in uh, companies like uh, Tencent and, and uh, Alibaba. Not too long after that, you would actually dominate the market for startups in uh, online education. Uh, it was, if, if not the strategic or the national security people who were starting to get a little suspicious of you, uh, certainly the CEO narrative was that uh, China was a great place. Uh, it might be a little difficult, maybe there were some IP issues, but it was a great place to do business. So if you're China, you're doing very well in 2009, 2010. Why change course? I think that's a very fundamental question. Um, and we're a room full of economists tonight, so you all believe in rational economic man and rational economic woman. Okay. Um, I've been in politics for a while. I believe less in rational economic man <laughs> and rational economic woman. Um, and dare I say it in this gathering, you don't have to spend too much long and uh, too much of a length of time in China to discover that the political economists have something to say. Um, so what do I mean by that? Deng was not a dummy. Deng Xiaoping, uh, when he took power after Mao's death in, uh, by 78, established a whole new orthodoxy for the country. And still, while justified within the wide framework of Marxism-Leninism, said that at this stage of uh, China's uh, economic history and economic development, consistent with Marxist theory, our challenge is to unleash the forces of production, the factors of production, uh, and relegate the relations of production, as Marxists would describe it, that is, class. 
because we needed to take people out of poverty and increase the economic power of the nation. So that became the orthodoxy for 35 years. Remember what Dung said, doesn't matter if a mouse, a cat is uh, black or white, so long as it catches mice. That was kind of his view of Marxism and capitalism, frankly. So what changed? Um, when Xi Jinping uh, came to power in 2012, 2013, there's a fascinating speech of his which gets leaked from the middle of 13 to the Central Ideology and Propaganda Work Conference. Not a conference of funsters, by the way. <laughs> um, um, these are people whose essentially lack of sense of humor. Uh, and the, uh, we're on the record here, aren't we? Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> they don't have much of a sense of humor. <laughs> but it's quite interesting when you look at this speech because uh, very rarely do you get stuff leaked out of, the, uh, out of the central system. It's a very watertight show. Um, and what it says is, this is my parsing of it, uh, is that I, Xi Jinping, have seen the future. I've seen where the Deng Xiaoping, Jiang Zemin, Hu Jintao tra trajectory is going to take us. I see the rise of a... Um, private entrepreneurial class, which now represents more than 60% of GDP. I see the rising levels of uh, individual uh, freedom of expression. Uh, I see Hu Jintao's model for a more contestable polity, which he used as a term, the reform of the political system. It's a phrase which they used. And, said, and I don't like that future, because mm -hmm. I'm a Marxist-Leninist. Em emphasize not the adjective, but the, but the noun. I'm a Leninist. And what he could see in the future was, because of the processes of economic development, which we all know through here in international development theory, you get to $12,000 US per capita income. There's a whole bunch of case studies out there in the world where people then say, rising middle classes, aspirations for greater and wider sense, uh, senses and realities of freedom, and then eventually change occurs. Look at the ROK, uh, look at Taiwan itself, look at other countries, look at Indonesia, yeah. for example. So he actually saw the future and said, no. Mm -hmm. And so at a level of politics, he actually then began to correct, from his perspective, the ideology of the country. And this, uh, if I was to give it the three sentence haiku, uh, it was uh, one, I'm turning politics towards the Leninist left. I'm turning the economy towards the Marxist left. And I'm turning foreign policy towards a nationalist and more assertive right. The latter being to consolidate the legitimacy of the party, as well as express what he then saw was the accumulated power of the Chinese state to begin to change the international status quo. So I think he saw the future, mm -hmm. said, no, that's gonna to lead to the death of the party and lead to the death of the party's control, I'm not going to allow that to happen. Yeah. Uh, I've, uh, I was saying to you earlier, we, uh, we had a way of thinking about this, that uh, you can't have economic liberalization and political control. And the uh, belief was, of course, economic liberalization would win out. And what you're saying is he came to power and said, thank you very much, I'll take political control. And uh, that was somewhat unexpected. Can you build that out a little bit more in terms of uh, the relationship then uh, between this political, uh, the political reckoning, if you will, uh, the kind of Gorbachev moment perhaps? Mm -hmm. Or I was saying to Kevin earlier that Hu Jintao once told us uh, that the, they had had 186,000 riots in one year. And he said now to President Bush, he said, now that wasn't about your democracy, so kind of don't get excited. Uh, the 186,000 riots were because a local party leader would seize a peasant's land and there was no recourse, so he and his friends would riot. So what we need are courts, he said, that could be trusted. Pretty soon you're starting to create something that looks more like an independent judiciary, so you could see how this might have played out from uh, Xi Jinping's point of view. But obviously, by going this route, um, it began to, sh to shut off some of the valve of the oil that was bringing economic growth and economic possibility to China. So do you think he reconciles that, or he simply says uh, it's worth the price? Does he think he can have it both ways? I think initially, um, Conde, he does. 
Uh, it's quite interesting if you look at the historical evolution of the turn after 2012. What happens first between 2012 and 2017, between the 18th and the 19th party congresses, uh, was you can see the clear evidence of a turn to the left on politics. Yeah. Uh, for example, your encounter with him with President Bush. Yeah. What did he do in that period? He basically said, uh, we've had enough of constitutionalism. We've had enough of separation of powers, thank you very much. Uh, we've had enough of this independent judiciary. We've had enough of, and he went on to say in this speech I referred to before in the middle of 13, enough of NGOs, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, and uh, the party rules all. In fact, it's a great phrase he used. He rehabilitated it from Mao. It doesn't matter whether we're talking about north, south, east, or west, whether we're talking about uh, the, um, the government, the military, the academy, uh, commerce, uh, or uh, he has one other phrase as well, which has just escaped my mind. But he said, the party rules in all. So that's a fairly unequivocal statement. Uh, <laughs> but you know what's really interesting? Through 12 and to 15, and even it drifting into 17, he leaves essentially the market economic reform program largely intact because he thought he could get away with this duality, which is I'm going to clamp back down on politics, but I'll let these guys who claim to know what the economy is all about continue to roll. This was under Premier Li Keqiang, who those of you who knew him or knew of him uh, tragically passed away only in the last several months. But then when you get to a couple of events, in particular, uh, their own domestic financial crisis in 2015. Those of you who followed Chinese financial markets will remember it. When Xi Jinping becomes um, enraged that you have massive stock market vol volatility requiring massive interventions by the Chinese state, which did not succeed, to protect the equity and investments of a whole bunch of working people. And it became clear to those of us in the analytical community that he said, whatever you guys think you were doing on the economy in terms of managing this market, it's not delivering for me politically. Mm. Roll the clock on two years, and then he has the experience of President Trump um, and says, uh, in response to this new age of strategic competition, uh, I, Xi Jinping, am going to have to become much more nationally self-reliant. So between 15 and 17, you see the dial change on the economy as well. Leninism had been brought back, but the rehabilitation of Marxism in terms of core economic policy settings, you see in that 15 to 17 period and dramatically demonstrated in the 19th Party Congress of that year. So I think that's the evolution of it. So now, fast forward to today, you have uh, slowing growth, high unemployment, particularly among youth, uh, a demographic disaster. Uh, I was reading that uh, uh, demographers have seen nothing like the inversion uh, that is happening in Chinese demography, save in wartime. And so uh, you have this, this problem. Real estate bubble, we could go on and on and on. Uh, foreign direct investment uh, dropping. Uh, does Xi Jinping have the ability, or he has the ability, but does he have the foresight? Does he wish to make a uh, change in course at this point? Or is ideology, as you've described it, um, and fear of what this would mean for the party, is it such a constraint on his imagination that he can't make a course correction? My analysis is reading what he generates in the party's internal ideological discourse. Because remember, the Communist Party has to talk to itself. And it does so partly in policy terms, partly in political terms, but fundamentally in ideological terms. Because Marxism, Leninism is the coin of the realm. That's the dialect within which messages are communicated about change or continuity. So when I look at um, uh, his language, what he essentially is saying to the party at home and to the rest of us abroad is that uh, I'm not done. I know this is a trade-off and I'm confident on my side of the trade-off. Mm. That is that, yes, growth will be interrupted uh, as it's historically been experienced 
but it is far more important that the paramount power and control of the party is preserved because it's this party which took us from the shambles of national dissolution in the pre-49 period where we were so weak that we were taken over by a bunch of foreigners then the Japanese invasion occurred uh, and then by the time we get to 49 there's not much left and we built this modern China through one agency, the agency of a Leninist party. So I, Xi Jinping, am not going to allow this to go. So I think he actually understands that there is an economic trade-off. But his response is a curious one in terms of, therefore, what the new economic script is. It's a response which basically says, uh, let's forget about the demand side of the economy. Let's forget about things like consumer confidence. Let's forget about things like uh, private uh, uh, domestic consumption. Uh, let's instead focus on what we do on the supply side. And I, Xi Jinping, am bringing in this new range of what he describes as the new productive forces of an industrial policy driven by high technology. Uh, and that is his attempt at a, from the commanding heights, if you're familiar with the ancient sort of Marxist uh, conceptualization of you know this from the Soviet yes. Union. Uh, here's this marvellous phrase, which is top-level command. Yeah. And so ding tong shi ji, these four character phrases, which I find remarkable in the 21st century, that I'm going to do this through industrial policy, the technology at the core. This will unleash new factors and forces of production which will charge us forward into a brighter economic future. Yeah. And how's it going on not, the technology front? Not entirely front. well. <laughs> um, as General Custis said, I think, uh, at Little Bighorn, there have been finer moments in the history of the 5th Cavalry. <laughs> and so, uh, in other words, not entirely well. Yeah. So if you look at the numbers, I mean, you've touched on them before, but market economists would see the economy growing maybe, leaving aside the official statistics, at maybe three this year. Uh, the, the Chinese have predicted 5.3, and it will come in at 5.3. Uh, because <laughs> 5.3 is 5.3. Yeah. And, uh, but if you go to the internal components, you know, private domestic consumption, fixed capital investments, residential construction, net exports, foreign capital inflows, uh, public investment, uh, all these, with the exception of the latter, are pointing south. And on the latter, what's interesting from a Keynesian perspective is that they haven't actually sort of pulled the lever in terms of public demand in order to offset what I think is a significant growth, uh, growth deficit on the demand side. Yeah. I'd like to go to the foreign policy in just a moment, but, uh, but I'd like to uh, first take advantage of the fact that you are Australian, not American, and I'll put it this way. Um, we are not known for our nuance in the United States. And you think Australians are? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's why we're such good friends. But. Uh, <laughs> The two the words Australian and diplomat really belong in the same sentence. <laughs> but if you think about it, um, six years ago, seven years ago, uh, it was the decline of the West, the rise of the East. Uh, China was on the march. Uh, the United States was in decline. In, in fact, uh, this was also the, uh, the way that perhaps Xi Jinping thought about it. It was certainly the way Vladimir Putin thought about it. But uh, now, all of a sudden, it's... China is flat on its back. China can't, uh, is not going to be able to turn this around. China is in decline. Uh, what have we missed that might be an explanation someplace in between those two extremes? Look, I love my American friends dearly, but the, uh, <laughs> occasionally you don't quite see things objectively. No. By, by which I mean, <laughs> There seem to be two schools of thought in the United States of America about China. China is either 10 foot tall yeah. or it's two foot tall, yeah, right. depending on the season. It's either, it's going gangbusters, there's no problems, they're going to take over the world, uh, the economy will overtake the United States by next Christmas, etc., etc., etc. Or, peak China, it's going down the gurgle, it's gone, and nothing will save it. Uh, my view is a bit different to that. You guys are six foot two, the Chinese are 5'9", and I'm not sure how much taller they'll get, but they're still growing. And so that, I think, is a more realistic 
geopolitical, geoeconomic, geostrategic analysis of where the, what the Chinese describe in their own language as the balance of power mm -hmm. in their own sense. You know, surely, uh, uh, surely uh, be. And so I think, uh, doi bi, and I think the, the important thing for us to consider is right now the Chinese economy, for the reasons we touched on before, in 24 will generate modest growth. There is deflation, uh, significant deflation, over three quarters now. Net capital outflows for the first time in 25 years in the fourth quarter last year. These are remarkable uh, facts. But never underestimate the power of the Chinese consumer if they regain a level of confidence. I cannot construct carefully uh, or scientifically how consumer confidence is restored, but savings are, are at an unprecedented high because people are concerned about how do they manage the risk of unemployment either for themselves or for their kids, how do they manage uh, a range of other challenges in their lives, including the loss of asset investments in the property sector. But I think we should not, it's, I, would all, I would urge analytical caution about assuming that this is therefore somehow mystically in terminal decline. Uh, keep our eyes focused on what happens with the Chinese consumer. And I, I am just open on that question. Right now, the settings are poor but we should be very careful before reaching any fundamental analysis, yeah. analytical conclusions. And what, what is your assessment uh, on the technology front of um, how well the substitution strategy will be, technology as the driver? We know, for instance, that the uh, effort to do a kind of indigenous, um, high uh, quality chip uh, seems not to have gone very well. Um, there are, we are kind of decoupling, we are decoupling. I know the administration wants to call it de-risking, but the fact is we're decoupling in technology. American venture capitalists are fleeing because they're being told by the US government that both outbound and inbound investment uh, is uh, un-American and unpatriotic. And so uh, how do you see China's technological future? There was a moment in time when they were going to dominate us in AI and then something came uh, along called generative AI, which it's very difficult for them to do without high-end chips. So can you set, level set for us the technology front? And then I'd like to, to take on foreign policy. And then I'm going to turn to the audience. So uh, if you have questions, please get them ready. And if you don't, I am a professor. I'll call on someone. So <laughs> Kevin. Yes, yes. That's terrifying. <laughs> yeah. I think. Um, Look, there are people in this audience who be far brighter than me on uh, nanometers, chips, and the rest. But I read the general literature on this subject. The Chinese industrial policy approach is pretty simple. Uh, what you can't obtain qualitatively, we will seek to secure quantitatively, which is uh, we'll throw $100 billion of activity at a given chip. Uh, and when you say to them, uh, hey, you're going to waste most of that, they say, we know. We're assuming a 5 or 10% return. And to be fair to the Chinese system, depending on which level of reportage you believe about where Huawei has gone with its most recent chip innovation, there are some evidences of moderate success. So their view is, you're right, it's not de-risking. It is heading in the direction of decoupling. And Xi Jinping's uh, doctrinal conclusion about that as we embarked upon, uh, through the United States leadership, a strategy of uh, strategic competition, uh, was we, China, under Xi Jinping's leadership, will now pursue a policy of national self-reliance. Uh, and that has gone from the margins of the economic commentary to the center. And secondly, if you try to deconstruct this odd phrase which they use to describe the current orthodoxy called the dual circulation economy, what does that mean? It means we are primarily de being de going to be dependent on the great internal circulation. What does that mean? Domestic production, domestic consumption. And that the great external circulation, which means foreign direct investment, and it means uh, net uh, exports, it will now occupy a lesser role. So conceptually and in policy terms, that's the direction which they've sought to go. And then in terms of the success ratio, their view is, it's harder, 
Um, but as the doors have been shut, whether it's a small garden with a high fence or a big garden with an even higher fence, uh, we, ha we, the Chinese system, have concluded that's where the US is going, and we're going to throw the kitchen sink. Do you have that expression in? Uh, yes. Thank yes. you. I always have to check my Australian English <laughs> uh, at this thing. And if we get a 10% success rate out of a trillion dollars worth of investment, which, by the way, if you combine their respective industrial funds, it's not much short of a trillion dollars worth of uh, being thrown at these uh, high technology categories, mm -hmm. then we in the Chinese system think we could still get there. Mm -hmm. uh, turning to foreign policy, maybe through uh, the chip and a company called TSMC, which exists in a place that some would consider vulnerable. Um, how should we think about uh, Taiwan? And uh, we I thought, are. I thought you meant Vermont. Uh, <laughs> well, Arizona, but okay. uh, but other than that, no. Um, I I want you to talk a little bit about Taiwan. I'm not going to ask you what are you telling your government. That would be unfair. Mm. But I am going to ask you what would you tell our government about Taiwan when we have one. <laughs> It's really important to, to uh, raise the Taiwan question because many rational folks that I know in this country and elsewhere in the world would say, well, why would China ever do it? Uh, that is, use unilateral military force to regain uh, sovereignty over Taiwan. And that's because politics is inherently irrational uh, on these sorts of questions. It's a question of national sentiment. It's a question of China's sense of its own sovereignty. It's a question of China's sense of its own history. So for anyone to assume this is not a central priority of the contemporary Chinese Communist Party uh, is not reading it objectively. That's just the truth of it. So the question is, um, well, how does Xi Jinping see this? My own view, uh, having looked at all the surrounding literature and uh, observing some of the evidence on the ground uh, is that uh, Xi Jinping uh, is uh, not a reckless risk taker. Mao Zedong could be argued to have been a reckless risk taker, remember? 49? Yeah. They've just won the revolution and three months later they got a million troops crossing the Yalu to take on the United States and Korea. Mm -hmm. That was reckless and you had the bomb and they didn't. Right. Xi Jinping is not of that ilk, but nor is he cautious. He is a calculated risk taker. So his calculus in terms of Taiwan, I think, is informed by the following factors. One, when does the balance of military power change more decisively in his direction? And that is now thrown into some uncertainty because the arrival of all the asymmetric warfighting capabilities that you've seen on display in the battle space in Ukraine. You've seen these, the, the three um, uh, uh, Russian uh, naval craft which have been sunk effectively by unmanned vehicles of one form or another. I mean, this would make a very disconcerting long play video in the PLA uh, <laughs> or in the Central Military Commission. Uh, so this is a refined calculus. My judgment is uh, that their view is that this balance of military power is not there for them at this stage. But they st still have a view that that is moving over time in their direction. The second factor is their calculation of American political will. Mm -hmm. And that's just the hard question, um, whether it's under a Democrat administration or a Republican administration, depending on who wins in November. And the third is, to a lesser extent, but it's still real, how does the rest of the world respond in foreign policy, economic terms, trade, investment sanctions? So in their calculus, I don't see evidence at this stage that any time short of 2027 that they would think that these things would begin to align. Um, and then when you've got to throw in the age factor of Xi Jinping, he's 71 years old, uh, five years time he's 76, and then by the time you get to the 22nd Party Congress he's about 80. And so Spring chicken in terms of our <laughs> politics. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway. <laughs> Zip. The, 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 um, and so therefore you start to put two sets of variables together, which is his age and his desire to frankly not just replicate Mao, to, but to exceed Mao by finally achieving the national reunification, which has eluded the CCP since 49. 
Against, however, there's still the tempering factors of the military balance of power and the other ingredients of what we would call integrated deterrence. So for me, what am I concerned about? I'm not really concerned about here to 27. I am more concerned about 27 to 32. Mm -hmm. And I, that's not f by way of me being interpreted as saying, therefore, it's going to happen in 27. That's just uh, reckless. What I am seeing, though, is that the, the analysis gets much sharper at that time, and possibly in some years following, but not a whole lot of years following. Uh, so it's still enough to keep us all up at night. And we, if, uh, if that's correct, we have some time. And so how should we think about what we're doing vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan? For instance, uh, there are those who say, we should, be, uh, we should abandon strategic ambiguity. Uh, we should make very clear to the time we've come very close. But how do you think about our preparation, and I say our because uh, Australia is an important ally in the Indo-Pacific. How do you think about using the time that we have if, in fact, uh, there's some kind of denouement after 2027? I think there are two sets of things that we need to focus on. One is what I describe as using the opportunity to build or rebuild, to the extent possible, a number of guardrails around the uh, China-US relationship so that we reduce the risk of crisis, conflict, and war by accident, which is why it's good that the two presidents agreed in uh, San Francisco here at the Woodlands Summit uh, in November to recommence mill-to-mill -mill dialogue remains to be seen how substantive that has proven to be over the last three months. But the essential machinery is we should not, through silence and non-communication, tolerate the possibility of incident occurring, two planes crashing, uh, colliding and then crashing, and then nationalism takes over, no constraint mechanism, and you have escalation. Remember 1914. Uh, the bigger question uh, is, if that is about reducing the risk of war by accident, is how do we reduce the risk of war by design? And that is through the complex science of integrated deterrence. Um, I call it sort of the Xi Jinping shaving mirror test, which is I'm sitting at Zhongnan High, I'm having a shave every morning, and I'm looking in the mirror and I'm asking myself this question, is it still too risky today? And the test of deterrence is to have that answer come back and say, yeah, I think it's still too risky. And so that is a responsibility for all of us against the various component parts of the deterrence equation, including, critically, political will. Yeah. Do you think that the, um, I'll, I'll call it, uh, Xi Jinping probably thinks, it of, thinks of it as uh, the containment alliance. Hmm. But of course, we don't contain. Uh, we're simply trying to create circumstances in which deterrence uh, is, is strong. Uh, is it as strong as it looks, Australia, the United States, Japan, uh, even uh, South Korea, to a certain extent even in India, maybe even Philippines, Vietnam? It looks like a quite formidable block of nations that uh, reacting both to wolf warrior diplomacy of a little bit earlier, uh, to some of the activity that China has engaged in, uh, in the South China Sea and beyond. Uh, it looks like a pretty strong uh, alliance, uh, loosely, not, not formal. Uh, do you think it's as strong as it looks, or how, sh how should we think about it? Not yet, mm -hmm. but trending that way. Um, I always see the, the deterrence, if you'll pardon the crudity of the analogy, it's like a pecan pie. Um, so we don't have them in Australia, but I gather you like them here in America. <laughs> uh, and most of them are round, is yes, that right? Yes, that's okay. correct. And so half of that pecan pie is a very clear military calculus by the Central Military Commission of force on force, unit on unit, capability on capability, across a Taiwan Strait scenario and sub-scenarios of what would happen if the balloon went up. And so that's why the, what the folks do in Indo-Pacific Command of the United States uh, Armed Forces is so critical, and with your friends, partners, and allies in the region. Then there is a separate piece of the Pecan Pie, which is critical, and that is Taiwan's indigenous capability of conveying its own deterrent message, deploying prospectively a range of asymmetric capabilities, 
so that if you were to apply, for example, the Ukraine scenario of two years ago, the ability of the Taiwanese, as the Ukrainians did, to actually halt or arrest or degrade any invasion activity in week one. That's important mm -hmm. as part of the pecan pie. And then there's another part of the pecan pie which is about political will here and on the part of allies. And the last part of the pecan pie is what the rest of the world does. And that is, would China suffer such fundamental damage to its economy and to its foreign policy standing in the world that what they'd inherit would be uh, not exactly the unblemished mantle of global mm -hmm. leadership. Mm -hmm. So I actually see it in those, those terms where each of us has this role to play. Is it there right now against the constituent elements? No, much building still has to be mm -hmm. done. Uh, but it's a dynamic business. And so there is no perfect science to this. Um, but what I'm impressed by with the administration is that the best minds in the administration are working on the machinery of this. And it's conceptually understood and it's based on a very realist understanding of how the folks in Beijing look at the same equation. Mm -hmm. And you know from your own vast experience dealing with the Soviet Union that um, you know, the Sovs were not known for their sense of humour. Okay? Um, I'll say. They, <laughs> they would count each ICBM, they would count uh, every tank uh, assembled against them in Western Europe, and they would make a calculus about deterrence along similar lines. Well, remember the, the methodologies inherited by these two yeah. Leninist systems are not entirely dissimilar. Good point. So one, one final question before we turn it open to, um, to you to ask what's on your mind. Uh, what keeps you up at night? We have uh, two cats from the Washington Cat Rescue <laughs> Society. And uh, we thought we were sort of engaged in a great charitable act by <laughs> taking in these two strays. And, and they jump all over the place. And they bite your toes, and they want to be fed at 3 o'clock in the morning. <coughs> you have very indisciplined cats mm -hmm. here in the United mm -hmm. States. That's what, I can say. what keeps me up at night? Uh, uh, was that, is that a metaphor somehow for <laughs> Washington? Or? No, 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 no. no. <laughs> The, uh, what keeps, keeps me up at night is partly what we've just touched on, which is, are we missing anything in the integrated decurrence equation? And I, that's, that is not an implied, let alone explicit criticism of the administration's analysis and response to that question. It's just me as an ally thinking that through. One thing that does keep me uh, anxious at night is this, which is, and what of the global south? Uh, what of uh, Africa, what of Latin America, what of the rest of Asia, and frankly, from time to time, parts of Europe. Um, and where, if I look at it objectively, um, China's message for the Belt and Road Initiative, China's message that we're not going to interfere with your local politics, um, uh, China's message of almost acceptable authoritarian resilience around the world. Uh, against the long-standing message of the Washington Consensus, which is looking more ragged mm -hmm. uh, 20, 20 years or so on, I do worry about the slow and gradual loss of the Global South, unless we're very careful. Um, so if you want to know what eats away a, a, mm -hmm. at me a bit, it's mm -hmm. we are focused on the central strategic question, but we all need to have a lateral view in terms of uh, the rest of the world, asking themselves in their own countries the very legitimate question of how do I develop my country, how do I open my economy, how do I sustain my political system, how do I deal with climate change, um, who's coming in the door with a check, is it the Chinese or is it someone else, uh, in order to fund a development project. This worries me. All right, who would like to lead off? Right, and we have microphone runners, I assume. So why don't you start at the table? Okay, don't. Come right here, yes. yes. Thank you so much for coming here. It's a very interesting discussion. 
Uh, earlier this week, the Financial Times had a very thought-provoking article called The Squawkus Over AUKUS. Mm -hmm. And in that was revealed that there was perhaps some dissension, uh, some, some concern in Australia about the alignment with the United States and our ability to, I'm going to put it this way, persevere in the Pacific Rim. I think this is very interesting to all of us here that sit on the West Coast and, and view this partnership with Australia with uh, uh, great pride and, and assign great value to it. But what do you make of this? There, there appears to be, according to the Financial Times, they felt that certain former leaders felt that um, AUKUS was throwing its weight behind a confidence in the United States that might not be warranted. Well, the great thing about both of our countries is that we're pretty uh, rambunctious democracies. And uh, last time I was in Washington, which was three days ago, I didn't sense a uniform view on most things. Uh, <laughs> and guess what? You go to Canberra, it's exactly the same because we're a pretty rambunctious democracy as well. What I can report to you, though, is that if you look at all the public opinion polls surveying in Australia, uh, the United States would have 70 to 80% popular support, AUKUS 60 to 70, 75% popular support. Uh, it's been endorsed by both sides of politics, centre-left parties, which historically I'm associated with, the Australian Labor Party, when I was Prime Minister of Australia, and it's now the Government of Australia, and the centre-right. So uh, I think of all your engagements with allies around the world, this is on pretty solid ground. And I think the, because we see it in all of its dimensions as good for Australian national security, because we're in a volatile part of the world, but we also have the view, and I think our United States colleagues have the same view, it's good for the United States. Uh, take, for example, the question of nuclear-powered submarines. At present, you have facilities to build these uh, boats which are highly sophisticated, highly lethal, a core element of uh, deterrent capabilities. You have them being made at present at Groton in Connecticut and Newport News in Virginia. And the Brits do the same up somewhere in Scotland. Um, last time I looked, none of those three locations were in the Indo-Pacific. Um, but that may be just our atlases and not yours. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so guess what? Uh, we're going to be building these things in Adelaide in South Australia and you're going to have this huge uh, uh, ship repair facility and maintenance and home porting in Western Australia in the middle of the Indo-Pacific. So that together with the additional capabilities that we'll have to throw at this, I think makes it good for the United States as well. So we see there's a mutuality in the interest and I think that's reflected in the body politic. Australians are a pretty practical mob, you know. And the other thing is they've got a bit of a memory. And uh, next time you go to Canberra, uh, and I assume you all will next weekend, the, uh, <laughs> it's just over that way a bit. <laughs> yeah, it's and, a lovely place. And down. Uh, that's right. The, uh, <laughs> anyway, I won't go there. The, uh, <laughs> my views of Canberra. Anyway, the, um, um, in the middle of our Defence Department buildings, our equivalent of the Pentagon, this is huge tower huge tower, which could, I don't know how tall it is. And at the top of it, there's an American Eagle, okay? It's called the American War Memorial. It is in the middle of our defense facility, in the middle of Canberra, the capital of Australia. That thing was built after 1945 by public subscription because of the World War II. Australians have a memory, you know, about the ties that bind. Thank you for your insightful comments. If you could choose the top five countries that you would bring together as an alliance to counterbalance China across rare earths, e economics, Taiwan, who would they be? And not just necessarily the likely people like the United States, but you mentioned who would be in the global south? Who in the continent of Africa? Who in Europe? And maybe it's not any of those, but who would be those top five countries you bring together? Um, I'm mindful I'm just an Australian ambassador, okay? <laughs> it's not for me to tell other countries what they should do, or, sh or uh, let alone the United States, uh, what it may, may do as the uh, leader of the free world. But as I observe things in the world, um, what I see is uh, a whole bunch of countries uh, who are seeking to carve out uh, different futures 
for themselves, other than that which is necessarily compatible with what Xi Jinping is outlining uh, for his country's future or for his proposed reform and change of the international system under Chinese leadership. I mean, I read this stuff. It's there in the Chinese literature. So obviously, uh, if you look at, uh, at India, it's fairly clear where India under Modi uh, wishes to go. Uh, you don't have to be a Rhodes Scholar to work out that uh, Japan has its own um, view. Uh, beyond that, uh, I think it's important to look at the future of countries like the Republic of Indonesia, uh, which has challenging um, uh, uh, development opportunities for the future, but one which is looking for long-term and sustained economic opportunities with this country through market access as well. And then beyond that, if I was to look at, um, uh, at Africa, there are democracies like uh, Nigeria, uh, which have um, a view of their own future, uh, which doesn't necessarily fit in with a, uh, a particular view. And in Latin America, the Western Hemisphere, uh, one better known to you uh, rather than to us, there are a range of countries from Chile to Argentina uh, through to uh, even um, uh, President Lula's uh, Brazil uh, and, uh, and Mexico, uh, which will have different views. The key point in all of this is, is as follows. Sometimes in the United States, you can get the impression that the United States see the future of alliance structures as being purely about security and defense. The truth is, if you are a leader in a democratic country, in any of the continents I've just referred to, you're responsible not just for physical security, you're responsible for economic security as well. And therefore, that brings us back to the question about whether markets are opened or closed, and whether there is opportunity for friends, partners, and democratic allies in the United States to have a share of a common economic future. Now, this is a hard question in domestic politics in America, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat seeking to survive a primary or to get yourself elected to the House or to the Senate. I get that. I mean, I'm a politician. I'm a former prime minister. These things are hard. But carving out a set of opportunities, not just about security, but about common economic opportunity, therein lies the magic, what I describe as source uh, for the future. Because that then gives ideational reflection, that gives concrete reflection to the ideational prospect which America opens for freedom, which is not just about sovereignty, not just about political freedom, but it's also an idea about economic opportunity. Yeah. And uh, after World War II, the United States had a commons in terms of security, but also an economic commons. And that is missing, it seems, from the discussion well, now. I think for all of us, look, it's, it's, this is not me being preachy to the administration or to any side of politics, but when I look around the world, the, the big question which many in the Global South will say, uh, our Chinese friends are here, they have a Belt and Road Initiative, uh, and they're seeking to build X, Y, and Z and A, B, and C. And where are you? meaning the West, I'm not just pointing at America on this. Yeah. So there's a question here uh, for the future uh, to go to the underpinnings of simply a list of countries. Yeah. I saw one uh, last question over here, yes. Uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Mark, for this outstanding day. Um, I've heard the Silk Road Initiative has not been maybe as profitable as hoped. And, uh, and with economic challenges, maybe more difficult to uh, pursue. And uh, uh, this is a wild card here, too. But I wonder if Wagner Group, is, I don't know what you call them, a horse hair shirt initiative, but uh, you know, something, are they a factor? Uh, so I, I'm really interested in the Silk Road Initiative prospects, and are there other influences that are disruptive to that? I yeah, can't but quite hear, no, sorry, so. sorry, yes, it was a little bit. But Belt and Road uh, in some trouble. Um, a trillion and a half dollars spent on Belt and Road. Is it getting what it was? And then along the Silk Road, how do we think oh, right, about it? Okay. Yes. Sorry about that. I um, didn't quite pick it up. Um, look, I think um, I go back to sometimes the um, 
phenomenon I see in America, which is China's 10 foot tall or two foot tall. Uh, Belt and Road Initiative about to conquer all or it's dead. Uh, you know, can I just suggest reality is sometimes a little more nuanced than the above. Um, the truth is, and you could see the evidence of this emerging from as uh, 18 and 19, that the original $3 trillion initiative, depending on how you calculate it, was being scaled back. But it's still continuing. Mm -hmm. And it's still part of the central Chinese foreign policy orthodoxy. Xi Jinping, for example, convened the Foreign Affairs uh, Work Conference at the Party Centre uh, on the 30th of December. So two months ago. These things are only held every five years. It's when the party elite gets together to determine what's the future foreign policy and security policy course for the country. And it's couched often in ideological generalities. Uh, the internal speech would be fun to get hold of, but we don't have a copy of the internal speech. Uh, and there, it's quite plain that China's continuing project in the Global South uh, is through the medium of the Belt and Road Initiative. It also talks uh, much more broadly about other grand foreign policy proposals for the future of the international system. What Xi Jinping calls a community of common destiny for all humankind. The Global Civilization Initiative, the Global Development Initiative, the Global Security Initiative. You strip it all back, what's it mean? It actually means, and this is a really important point maybe to conclude on ideology. If you look at it really carefully, what the internal text is saying is that we are constructing a different view of the future of the international system based on our own domestic Marxist principles. Uh, and that the values that we would import into the future of the international system, and I'm paraphrasing here, will be consistent with our domestic Marxist principles. And furthermore, um, that uh, these um, new arrangements, if you look carefully at the text, will not just be some um, gaggle of free-range chickens. Uh, it'll still occur based on the fulcrum of a great power, mm -hmm. except that great power is not the United States. And so BRI, Belt and Road Initiative, the Silk Roads, maritime and land-based, is still up there in lights as of six weeks ago in the official ideological orthodoxy of where China wishes to take the global south in the future. Hence why it's a real challenge. Yeah. And we can't just pretend it's not there. No. I'd like to just close on the following. Um, you are ambassador uh, to the United States from one of our most reliable um, allies. I've often said I loved being uh, hearing from the Australians because unlike most of the world, when I was Secretary of State, what problem can you fix for us? Can you fix this problem? The Aussies would call and say, I think we've got this. We'll call you if we need you. So uh, it was always a pleasant call with Australia. But I'd, I'd like you to, to say to the United States, what, does, uh, what do our most reliable allies need to hear from the United States? Uh, we're going through um, a season, um, and uh, it's part of our democracy, as you said, the cacophony of democracy. Uh, but what would you like the United States to say, the United States uh, in quotes, uh, if you're one of our most reliable allies? What is the reassurance? I think from both sides of American politics, uh, R's and D's, it's, uh, it's self-evident and it's simple, but it's true. Um, consistency. Um, and, uh, and I make that not as a partisan comment, I make it as a simple observation in response to the question, which is, the thing about an alliance is, when you look at the documents, what do we actually ultimately commit to? We commit to defending each other. And that's either an enduring commitment or it's not. So when we signed on the bottom line in 1951 with the ANZUS Treaty, that's what it meant. The only time we've invoked it was um, September 11th. Yes. Uh, when also you guys got attacked. Yeah. Also uh, NATO. And uh, so we then threw in troops to Afghanistan within a week or two. Yeah. As you know, you were in office. Uh, and so we were there in the uh, sort of the first wave or the second wave. So consistency is, I think, a key element. Um, I think the Allies have a responsibility also, which is to separate out noise from reality. 
uh, rather than just being panicked by any piece of political noise. I've been around politics long enough to know that sometimes there's a lot of noise um, and they may not always reflect a fundamental uh, change in reality. And I think the last one is this. Um, when I, and I say this just as a sinologist. You know, I'm, I'm, none of my remarks tonight are as representing my country, by the way. I'm just here as uh, a China guy China, trying to add to the conversation. Um, is uh, It's really important for America to once again uh, lift the eyes of the world um, uh, in a sustained fashion, both sides of the aisle, with an enduring vision for what the future has for us all. Global North, global South. Um, and, uh, you know, in times past, you've described it in your own literature as a light on the hill. Uh, you know, Winthrop was not a fool. Um, and so there is something in the narrative uh, which is always in need of continuing uh, refresh. Um, and I think whoever forms government after, um, after uh, November, uh, that's a challenge uh, for all of us, because I do see the emergence of an alternative narrative, and one which is being effectively and skillfully communicated, particularly across the global south, deploying all the algorithms that we're familiar with, and multiple means of media, down to sub-localities. So, careful about the narrative, clear about the narrative, and its communication to multiple audiences. See, after 45, you folks did that. I mean, the world's in a mess at 45. But you know something? There's the guy who ran the drapery store out in Missouri, uh, Harry S. Truman. It's, it's remarkable what happened in that period. And so it was sustained under Eisenhower and uh, Republicans and Democrats over multiple administrations. So sustaining the bipartisanship, sustaining the consistency, but also sustaining and refreshing the narrative for the world. And I think that uh, keeps us in good shape. Well, on that note, thank you. Please join me in thanking Kevin. <laughs> <laughs>